Okay, this tutorial is about the emotional brain. I taught this class to my modern home ec middle schoolers, and it went so well that I just wanted to share it with all of you. So we're going to be talking about the limbic system. This is sort of the emotion center of the brain. It's not necessarily where all the emotions get processed, but it's where they first get started. And it's really important part of the brain for forming emotions. So here is a map of the brain. This is what the emotion center of your brain looks like. It is called the limbic system. And it's an emotion center because it's literally in the center of the brain. If you look at where it's located, it's really deep and central to the brain, which means it's one of the first parts of the brain ever developed when we were evolving. So it's very vital. Um, it's very um, automatic and has kind of been a part of who we are since the caveman days. So that's the map of the limbic system, which is the emotional center of the brain. We're going to be talking about four main areas. You see there are lots of areas labeled in the picture, but the four main areas that really have to do with emotion are the thalamus or thalamus, depending on how fancy you are, the amygdala or amygdala, the hippocampus or the hypothalamus or hypothalamus. Um, so these are the four main areas that have to do with creating emotion. So let's get into them. All right, let's start with a thalamus or thalamus. Um, this is like the data collector of the brain. This part of the brain collects information from four of your senses, not all five. We'll talk about smell later. Um, and they decide where to send that information next. So um, if you think about the office, <laughs> if you watch the office, the thalamus is like the Pam Beasley of the brain. It collects the information. It's the receptionist, you know, that gets the information in and then decides where to send it from there. And that's going to be information coming from what you see, what you hear, what you feel, and what you taste. Okay, but not what you smell. So first information goes to the thalamus. Then it decides where to send it next. So the amygdala which may be where the thalamus sends that information next, is your protector. It's like your bodyguard. It regulates powerful emotions like fear, anxiety, anger, and violence. It takes the information that the thalamus gives it, and if needed, it figures out a way to protect you. Okay? So this is the, brain, this is the part of the brain that's like, <clears throat> no, you're not going to hurt this person. We're going to figure out how to get out of this situation, how to protect ourselves from anything. Like, it's a tough guy, okay? It's a real bodyguard. Fun fact about the amygdala is if you have an overactive amygdala, so let's say that you're just kind of born with this really, really super-powered amygdala, that's when you're going to see things like anxiety disorders or people who maybe have problems managing their anger. This can come from one or two ways. So your amygdala can become overactive from just kind of naturally the way your body chemistry is, the way you were born. Um, and then that's when you see anxiety disorders that aren't really as a result of anything major. Um, you just kind of have a more sensitive amygdala. Or if you've had life experiences that have caused your amygdala to be overactive because it needed to be really active at some point in your life and it just kind of got stuck that way. And so that's when you see um, anxiety disorders, basically like fear that really doesn't have anywhere to go. You know, you're feeling anxiety, but you're not really sure why. Um, or if you get angry really easily or the anger is like always your first response to things. Like whether you're sad or you're afraid, whatever it is, it comes out as anger. That's usually because your amygdala is working overtime. Okay, the hippocampus of the brain. It's the memory maker. It takes all the things that come in and it decides is this short term or is this long term memory. So when you're super, um, when something is more meaningful or more powerful or been really well processed for you, it goes not into the nice long term. So you think about vacations. Why do you remember vacations so well in your long term memory? That's when you go back and think about childhood memories or old memories when you were younger. 
It's usually something like a vacation that you remember. Um, and that's because it's gone into the long-term memory box because A, it stood out from your everyday experiences and B, it's usually enjoyable or just like um, really unique from what you're used to experiencing. So when something really unique and interesting happens, it's like, ooh, we're putting this in the long term, yeah. Or if it's not so interesting, but you think you need to know it for now, you put it in the short term. That's why you, oftentimes you'll memorize stuff for a class. Um, you'll cram, 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 and you'll make an A on the test, but literally like the next week can't remember half the stuff that you learned. And that's because your hippocampus was like, I'm not that interested in this, but I need to know it for like right now to get through this class. So I'm just going to put it in your short term and then this is not really useful to us after. We're going to kick it out as soon as you get this test over with. So you can thank your hippocampus for that. And the best way to get things from the short term into the long term, um, especially stuff that you're learning in school, is to find a way to make it interesting. If you're interested in it, your hippocampus wants to hold on to it longer. Okay, fun fact. If negative experiences or memories aren't properly processed, they don't ever make it to the hippocampus. This is why when you remember a cringy moment or even a traumatic moment, especially, it feels more intense than a pleasant memory. So in other words, when you think of things like PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is someone who's experienced a traumatic event and then they'll have things that trigger that memory, but it doesn't feel like a memory. It feels like it's happening right now. And a very small version of that are cringy thoughts. So if something really embarrassing happened to you in elementary school, you pooped your pants or something like that, and then you remember it later and you still feel that shame as if it's happening right now, that's because that memory did not get properly processed by the hippocampus. It kept it as a fresh thing and keeps triggering your amygdala. So it's more like something that's happening right now. Your body responds like it's happening now because it didn't get properly processed and put into the hippocampus where it's more of a memory. So that's very interesting and important to remember that when you have those cringy thoughts, you really need to sit and process that, that emotion and, and, feel through it so that you can properly put it where it belongs, which is in memory. Okay, next is the hypothalamus. That's another place that information can go from the thalamus. The hypothalamus is the doctor. He prescribes the medicine or chemicals that the body needs based on what phase the body's in. And you're typically in one of two phases in your autonomic nervous system. One is rest and digest. That means your body is safe. Your brain's like, okay, the hypothalamus assesses the situation. Okay, this body is safe. Let's send some nice endorphins because they're going for a walk and they feel good. Um, let's send some nice serotonin because they're getting ready for bed and it's been a nice day and they're totally safe. That Those chemicals tell the body to relax. They tell your digestive system to get working because you're not running for your life. So, you know, you can go to the bathroom, you can sleep, you can do all these other things because you're not in danger. The other phase that your body might be in is fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And in those cases, the hypothalamus is going to send things like cortisol or adrenaline to your body to say, shut down digestion. We don't have time to poop right now. We are about to get attacked by a tiger or something terrible is about to happen. So it shuts down all your digestion. We're not going to sleep right now. We're not going to be cozy and comfy right now. We need to get ready for protection. So the hypothalamus is going to turn that, you know, the amygdala is going to be working with it and everything is going to shut down. It's going to send all the chemicals that get you ready to fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. So let's talk about what those four things are. The fight, flight, freeze, or fawn are four different ways that your body can handle being afraid, being threatened, or being in danger. Fight means you're going to, you know, let's say a tiger's coming up to get you, you're going to punch that tiger. Like you're ready to take that tiger on. Flight means you're what? Flighting. You're running from that tiger. You're darting out. Freeze means you're going to play dead or um, just freeze where you're at and hope that he doesn't see you because you're being really, really still. And fawn means you're going to be friends with the tiger. Like maybe if you pet him, maybe if you get him some steak, maybe if you do be really nice to him, he's not going to kill you. So I want you to think about 
what is your most common response? So we all use all four of these responses at different times. Like it may be that <clears throat> if a friend is under threat, you might be willing to fight. Um, or, you know, there might be other times where you would run from a bully. But then there are other times where you're going to freeze, right? And there are other times when you fawn. So I'll give you an example and I'll give you four ways of responding. And I want you to think about what is the most likely one that you would do. And then you know that your hypothalamus has kind of a preferred way of dealing with threats and keeping you safe. So let's say you're in class. Someone walks in like a new kid. He's a real jerk. You can tell. And he, when he walks by you, he like calls you some nasty name or says something ugly about what you're wearing, you know, like nice backpack idiot or something. Okay. So is your first response to say something rude to him back? Like you're an idiot too, or you look stupid. Look at you. Is that your first response or most likely response? If so, that's fight. Is it to kind of find a reason to kind of get up and leave the room, you know, go to the, oh, suddenly you have to go to the bathroom. You want to get out of there? That would be flight. Is it to just pretend like you didn't hear him, you know, and just act like you didn't hear anything, act like nothing happened? That would be freeze. And is your instinct like, oh, okay, maybe I should just jo like act, laugh it off, like laugh at him, think, oh, that's funny. Oh, yeah. That would be fawn. Like maybe if you befriend the bully, he won't be mean to you. So think about those four answers and think about which one is kind of your go-to. That's very helpful. Now, fun fact. Your sense of smell, remember we talked about that earlier. That skips the Pam Beasley, the thalamus of the brain, and goes straight to the hypothalamus. Your sense of smell is the only sense that goes straight to the hypothalamus. That's why when you smell something familiar, you, it immediately transports you or creates a certain feeling in you, even if you can't totally remember why or what it is about that smell. Um, two examples of that are like, if you've ever gotten sick, like maybe you threw up when you ate, <laughs> when you ate something and then maybe you smell the Fruit Loops, like you ate too many Fruit Loops and you threw up and then you smell them again later and you immediately feel sick. Um, that's, that's what's happening. It's going straight to the hypothalamus and creating a, taking you right back to that moment. Or sometimes if you smell something in like you had a friend's house who used that same candle when you were in second grade and you smell it and you're like instantly transported back to second grade. You can't do that really with any other sense. Only the sense of smell kind of instantly transports you without you having any control over it at all. I think that's really cool. Okay. Now, those are the four systems, uh, the four parts of the limbic system that affect emotion, but they're very automatic. You can't really control them, okay? Like how, how your thalamus, how overactive your amygdala is, all those things happen really automatically. And the only thing keeping you from just your gut reaction, you know, or the only thing giving you any hope to either calm down that amygdala or tell that hypothalamus, you know, um, to chill out, not send so much cortisol, stress hormones to your body all the time. The only thing you can really do to control that is the prefrontal cortex, which that develops way later in life. Um, so the prefrontal cortex is not part of the limbic system, but it plays an important role in emotion. It's your regulator. The limbic system has existed since caveman days. It's so automatic. It's so hard to control. And there's just not much hope of controlling that. The frontal lobe and the frontal cort prefrontal cortex developed to give you a chance at having reason and logic play in. It gives you the opportunity to do deep breathing, to know, okay, I'm f to feel yourself automatically feeling really anxious thanks to the amygdala. Your prefrontal cortex is the part of your brain that can say, hmm, is there truly anything to feel very anxious about? Okay, not really. Um, I shouldn't be this anxious about like that my friend had a tone today. It can reason that out and go, okay, let's do some deep breathing. Or let's go for a walk outside and then think of, see if this is bothering me as much as it was before. <clears throat> so use that prefrontal cortex. So for example, you see a friend laughing with someone else. Your limbic system tells you instantly, be jealous. Go over there, like knock your friend over the head with a club and drag them back over to you. That's your friend. That's not their friend. 
your frontal lobe will tell you, hmm, they can be friends with me and other people. I have more than one friend and it's not a problem. Maybe I should just leave them alone. But the fun fact about the prefrontal cortex, if you're finding it hard to control that limbic system right now, it's because the limbic system develops years ahead the pre of the prefrontal cortex. The limbic system is done developing like by age 14, it's got all its muscles, it's working full time, your amygdala is going crazy. Your limbic system is fully developed. But the prefrontal cortex that kind of tells the limbic system to be logical and calm down doesn't fully develop until ages 25, up to 25. I guess it could, for some it's like 21, some it's 25, somewhere around in there. So if you think about it, between ages 11, when that limbic system, um, like a limbic system is done developing between 11 and 14. And the prefrontal cortex is done developing between 21 and 25. So if you think about ages 11 to 25, they can be kind of crazy times, right? That's middle school, high school, college, young adult years. That's when things are really kind of crazy and also really wonderful for a lot of reasons. But the reason it's like that is because your brain is developing at a different rate. Now, some people say, oh, I was so much more logical, though, when I was younger, like when I was like eight to 11 years old, I was like, made these really good choices. I had it all together. What happened? Well, that's because between ages eight and 11, for a little period of time, the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system are at the same pace of growth. So you've got kind of this equally grown brain for those few wonderful years. That's why those kids are pretty logical. They usually got it pretty together. They aren't that stressed out. And then, then a lot of times you think, what happened to me? I was like the smartest kid in class. I was in the eleva elevated programs. I, was, I had it all together. And then it all fell apart in middle school. Well, it didn't. It's just that your limbic system started rapidly growing and your prefrontal cortex just took its sweet time and sort of sat in the same spot for a while. So give yourself some grace during this time. Understand that your limbic system is going to be doing some stuff for a while. Give your prefrontal cortex some time to grow and just be patient with yourself in the meantime. But the best thing you can really do, honestly, if you want to balance all of these systems out, give yourself the best shot while you patiently wait to turn 25, is to think about your basic needs. The limbic system is in the caveman part of the brain. So think about the caveman needs and that's eat, sleep drink um yeah <laughs> so eat decently like don't give that amygdala tons of sugar to get all hyper on drink plenty of water that flushes everything out just keeps everything working well and sleep at, at like middle to high school age you need an average of at least eight to ten hours of sleep per night so let yourself sleep right Oh, and breathe. The other thing you need to do is breathe. And we really don't breathe very well as modern day humans. So take deep breaths. Take Practice taking up to 10 second long breaths. And that will really will regulate because when you breathe deeply, that's what the body does when it's safe. If there was a tiger around the corner, it's not going to be breathing deeply, right? So it tells, you know, when we talk about the... Um, thalamus taking in the Pam Beasley taking in information she's like oh well they're breathing I feel like there's a tiger there but now they're breathing really deep and slowly so they must be calm so they must be safe and then she tells everybody else like hey guys calm down like they're breathing like they're sleeping you know they're breathing like they're super relaxed so obviously they must not be under threat so let's everybody chill out so if you take care of those basic needs, it'll take care of that basic central part of your limbic system. And then by the time that prefrontal cortex is done developing at 25, you'll be so set it won't even be funny. All right, that is our presentation for today. All about the emotional part of your brain. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to me. My email is thekidfactoryatl at gmail.com. And you can find all sorts of other information on Instagram at the underscore kid underscore factory or go to my website at thekidfactory.org and share this video so more people can know that their brain is just fine. They just need to be patient with it. Bye-bye.